And I am now going to pass the microphone on to Linda Holkema, who is the editor of La Pintura, Arara's newsletter. And she will say a few words about the conference coming up in May and then introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I am the editor of La Pintura, and our current issue is coming out imminently. And for those who are new to Arara or to our lecture series, um, La Pintura is our quarterly digital newsletter that contains information and articles on rock art conservation and preservation, uh, research project updates and upcoming events and things like our speakers. And also uh, we have some information on the upcoming conference. And speaking of the conference, we um, there's a lot of information up on our Aurora website. Um, this is a special year for us because it's our 50th anniversary and it's also the 50th is the founding year of Aurora and we are returning to the location of that original meeting in Farmington. Farmington also has a lot of really great rock art and we think you will find those presentations and field trips to be really great. Registration for the conference and the field trips are not quite available. They will be available, uh, I th believe the beginning of April. However, you can register for the hotel at the uh, Aurora negotiated rates at this time. And the link for that is on the conference details page on our website. Um, although you can't register for our field trips just yet, there is a full list of all the trips and there's some really great ones on there. So you can uh, start researching those. If you're interested in presenting a paper, um, our call for papers closes tomorrow. And there are links on the website for how to submit it. So now I'm going to shift our attention to introducing tonight's speaker, Jared Roberts. Uh, his initial fascination with archaeology was kindled um, amid the majestic site of Chichen Itza. Um, as a child, the ancient Mayan cultures filled him with wonder and sparked curiosity that would eventually guide his career path. However, it was during his tenure at Boggy Creek Farm as part of his education at Austin Community College that his passion for archeology span truly flourished. Transferring to Texas State University after relieving his associate in science ramped up his excitement even more. And it was there amidst the rock shelters and earth ovens and rock art that his life's work began to take shape. His path led, then led him to join the Ancient Southwest Texas Project, ASWT, at Texas State University under the mentorship of Steve Black and Charles Koning. And their guidance introduced him to the region of the Lower Pecos Canyonlands. The Lower Pecos became his focus and he dedicated several field seasons to its exploration. Upon completing his Bachelor's of Science at Texas State, he immediately joined the crew at Shumla Archaeological Research and Education Center, and there his focus was on the documentation of Pecos rock art, particularly through the significant Alexandria project, which revisited over 200 rock art sites. His work in this period allowed him to refine his skills in photography and 3D modeling, which are essential tools in the preservation and study of archaeological wonders. His commitment to archaeology extended through academia and research. He devoted countless hours to the Witt Museum, the ASWT, the National Park Service, and Seminole Canyon State Park, engaging with the community and contributing to the preservation and education of the Lower Pecos Archaic. He was president of the Texas State Archaeology Club and chair of the Rockford Interest Group for the SAAs. And recently, he and a group of Texas State University students created a podcast entitled Relics, Ruins, and Rascals with the hope to entertain and reach out to all with an interest in anthropology. Pursuing further education, he returned to Texas State for his master's degree. And there he was guided by Dr. Carolyn Boyd and her expertise and mentorship were pivotal in his, ex his specialization, particularly in rock art studies. Tonight, Jared will share with us the fruits of his thesis research on the red linear style pictographs of the Lower Pecos. Take it away, Jared. Howdy, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. As you said, um, as Linda said, it, 
I am Jared Roberts, and I will be talking about my thesis research, assessing the variability and chronology of the Red Lantern style pictographs in the Lower Pecos Canyon lands of Texas. But before we get into that, I would definitely like to extend my deepest thanks to my committee who actually made this possible. Um, my committee chair, Dr. Carolyn Boyd, and committee members, uh, Britt Bowsman and Dr. Karen Steelman. They helped me so long, so much along the way, and I actually think the results are something I think we can all be proud of. So without further ado, let's get started. The study aims to refine our understanding of the red linear style figures through comprehensive data analysis from across 25 sites and establish their chronology by dating seven figures. Um, each exemplifying very clear diagnostic attributes. The rationale behind this will soon become clear, but let's kind of review the approach before we get there. First, we're going to go ahead and start with an introduction to the Lower Pecos Canyon lands and its rock art and segue that into past research on the subject um, and investigations. Then I want to go ahead and outline my thesis objectives, methods, and questions. Um, then we're going to go into a little bit of analyses, followed by the results. And then if you're still listening to me by the end of this, I'm going to go ahead and conclude with a discussion on the new insights. So without with further ado, let's get this going. Oh yeah, there we go. Discussion, implications, and conclusion. We'll do we'll do that too. All right, so if for, for, you aren't familiar with it, the Lower Pecos culture area is situated around three major rivers, the Pecos, the Devils, and the Rio Grande. Uh, the Lower Pecos region was initially hinted at by distinctly beveled pr Pandel projectile points, uh, but it's really the pictograph, specifically the Pecos River style, that uh, remained the defining boundary. Um, as you can see in this uh, uh kind of boundary by Solvig Turpin in a lot of her work back in 2004. But what I kind of want to see or what you I want you to get from this is the southern boundary is very faded and that's going and in, extending into Coahuila, Mexico. We know Pecos River style um, extends into it, but we don't necessarily know how far. So it still remains a little fuzzy. What makes this region particularly enticing to archaeologists is that it provides evidence of over 12,000 years of continuous prehistoric hunter-gatherer occupation. Uh, the Lower Pecos climate has remained relatively arid throughout the majority of the Holocene, and this coupled with the numerous rock shelters across the Karstic landscape really creates an excellent grounds for preservation of perishable materials and, of course, world-class rock art. Uh, the Lower Pecos boasts a variety of rock art styles that reflect kind of an extensive cultural history. Notable styles include the most famous Pecos River style, but also the bold line geometric style, the red monochrome style, historic period imagery, and then of, finally, what we're going to be talking about today is the red linear style. So the red linear style primarily features monochromatic anthropomorphic figures uh, engaging in a variety of group activities from subsistent practices, hunting and gathering, and sometimes some very private interactions as well. Um, I'm sorry if you hear things in the background. I did not know that there's a bike race going on about uh, 100 yards from my hotel room. So if you hear that, that's what that is. Anywho... Uh, primary characteristics of the red linear imagery are usually associated with the anthropomorphs themselves, and they can include stick bodies with splayed legs, along with pointed heads, hooked headdresses. Another body type is the curvilinear body type, which gives kind of an expression of fluidity. The figures are often kneeling or squatting positions and tend to have pointed or round shaped heads. One of the defining attributes for the style specifically are the biological sex characteristics such as phalli or vulvas. And also we have some secondary sex characteristics like breasts. Here you can see a wide body anthropomorph or anth for short. I'm not sure if I'll probably use those interchangeably, 
But in a nutshell, wide body anthropomorphs are stick bodied, but just with a wider body than their legs and arms. That's basically all the difference is. Sometimes they can be center styled as well or have some elaborate designs in between. Uh, figures are also often portrayed with various paraphernalia like atlatls, stick bars, and rabbit sticks. And based on the presence of atlatls, both the Red Linear style and the Pecos River style are thought to be produced sometime in the Archaic period. Now, how they re now they actually relate to each other over this period of time is one of the major questions. So while red linear zoomorphs display characteristics that allow for stylistic uh, identification, specifically elongated legs and appendages, identification becomes a little tricky without a greater context of what's actually around them. So kind of hypothetically speaking, if I were to want to radiocarbon date the style, I would probably tend to focus on the diagnostic anthropomorphs. And that's exactly what I did. So the diagnostic attributes associated with red linear anthropomorphs are just easier to identify. In particular, sex markers such as phalli or vulvas are uh, only occur in the red linear imagery of this region. Here you can see another red linear diagnostic, which is the penis emblem or phallus adornment, and which basically is a line or two lines extending down from the tip of the penis. But why does all this matter? Uh, well, if you want to be sure you are studying a particular style, you absolutely must know its defining characteristics or else how are you going to identify it? It's also in these characteristics or attributes where the potential to learn certain aspects and dynamics of a culture um, that's it's often nearly impossible or downright difficult to do if you only look at the typical archaeological deposits. You just can't do that. So now, kind of that we have a general idea of what the red linear style is, let's take a look at the problem my thesis or my research attempts to address. Oh, hey, look at that. That's, that's also a good one. <laughs> so while Forrest Kirkland, um, we're going to first talk, kind of talk about the previous investigations and how I was able to come up with the questions that I did. Um, first identifying was Forrest Kirkland and Lula Kirkland back in the 20s and 30s. They were the first to identify red linear style figures being different than the Pecos River style figures. Um, and they found this while illustrating the rock art at the Red Linear type site. Uh, but it wasn't really until the 1960s before it was truly typed into a style. Uh, when discussing a specific site, Cueva Quebrada, which was a newly identified Red Linear style site, Terrence Greeter interpreted one of the scenes present as depicting a herd of animals, possibly being a deer or a buffalo. After a few mentions uh, beyond that, red linear discussion didn't really become much until Solvig Turpin began to really nail down what red linear style actually was in the 1980s. Uh, Turpin th synthesized uh, previous research done by Greeter, Kirkland, and also Newcomb uh, with new data in her interpretation. Partially based on Greeter's mention of possible bison and the knowledge of when bison were in the area, she kind of she proposed that the red linear style occurred during the late Archaic or the Ciblo sub period, starting around three thousand years ago. Turpin hypothesized that the style was introduced into the area by bison hunters following herds south during a brief mesic interval, um, and as such, the introduction of the bison into the area and in the intrusion of the plains groups were thought to factor in to the end of the Pecos River style, which was presumed to be much older than the Red Linear style. In 1995, uh, Wayne Ilger actually sampled the paint from one of the supposed bison at this Cueva Quebrada site uh, for radiocarbon dating use, uh, using a then experimental technique called plasma oxidation. And plasma oxidation basically extracts the carbon from the paint organics um, prior to AMS dating. 
And the date that they received placed the red linear production to around 1520 to 920 Cal BP. And while this date didn't fall directly into that Ciblo sub period, the date was used to generally support that the red linear style had that bison association with it. And that's kind of where it stayed in the literature for almost 29 years, 20 or 30 years. Uh, but one issue I kind of want you to understand is, is they dated an ovoid shape. And that ovoid shape lacks diagnostic attributes of red linear style. It is in association with red linear figures that do have diagnostics, but it in itself does not. Uh, this ovoid shape is one of 17 figures, and as you can see with the yellow circle, um, well, as you can see in that area, only four really exhibit zoomorphic elements, and none display diagnostic red linear attributes, let alone diagnostic bison attributes. And then also in addition to this, this is only a single date uh, with possible red linear associations. And then kind of as the saying goes, one date is no date. So all the way into, 19, or into 2013, Boyd et al. examined 444 figures from 12 sites uh, that contained diagnostic red linear style attributes. They collected information on anthropomorphic attributes, including height, body type, color, head shape, patterning, aspect, sex, gender, all of the above, among many others. But uh, from these data, Boyd et al. kind of identified multiple diagnostic characteristics that are att attributable to the red linear style. In addition, they noted 38 stratigraphic occurrences of diagnostic red linear figures underneath Pecos River style imagery. And remember, Pecos River style was supposed to be older, so that just kind of doesn't match. Relatively dating the red linear style, they supposed that it was either older than or contemporaneous with Pecos River style. So the 2013 data directly challenged the previous assumptions of the red linear timeline. And so at that point, a general consensus is was still up in the air. Even with solid stratigraphic analysis, there's just something about a radiocarbon date that people really hold on to, even if it's something from non-diagnostic at a non-diagnostic figure. And that's kind of the problem that I intended to shed light onto with my research. There are data to suggest that red linear style is older than Pecos River style. And then there's also data su to suggest that it's more recent. So to address this, my main questions were pretty straightforward. What is the red linear style and what are the patterns that connect one red linear site to another? What are the differences in variation within those attributes? And looking at that, that's one way that I can tackle my next question. When was the red linear style produced? Does it occur during the presence of a bison or intrusionary group using other data from the archaeological record? Or does it occur deeper in time as the Boyd et al. paper suggested? Also, how does it relate to the other styles of the Lower Pecos? Does it coincide with other rock art? Are each styles represented of different cultures? Um, and just to begin to even think about tackling such these big, broad questions, it was at least clear to me that I needed to have clear and direct absolute dating methods um, to solve these problems or at least address these problems. And luckily, the plasma oxidation technique uh, has come a heck of a long way since 1995 and is considered fairly reliable. So... My objectives are, or objectives were, conduct an attribute analysis of red linear anthropomorphic figures using the newly acquired data, contrast, compare, and combine the Boyd et al. 2013 data set with a new data set or expanded data set, identify the patterns within the attributes themselves, collect, prepare, and submit some seven samples for AMS radiocarbon dating using diagnostic attributes as my primary source for dating, 
And then, of course, analyze those radiocarbon dates obtained and determine the relationship at least within itself and the Pecos River style. I also needed to make sure what I was dating was in fact red linear style, since the diagnostic attributes were easier to identify within anthropomorphs themselves. I focused or I chose to focus solely on anthropomorphic figures as opposed to zoomorphs, because zoomorphs, you needed all that context and it was just easier to focus primarily on the anthropomorphs themselves. For my data set, I turn to Shumla's recent work during the Alexandria project. If y'all aren't, aren't familiar with it, in 2017, the Shumla Archaeological Research and Education Center began the Alexandria project, and the goal was to conduct baseline data over 350 rock art sites. I think we ended up at like 240, um, and the project was guided by incredibly a lot of research questions and even developed a heck of a lot more as we went, kept on going through it. But what we did was we created a baseline data set uh, that was filled with tech site forms, which is the state form, GPS coordinates, 3D models, high resolution gigapans, which was absolutely crucial for this thesis. During the Alexandria project itself, uh, 15 new sites were recorded containing diagnostic red linear anthropomorphs in addition to the 10 sites with diagnostic anth anthropomorphs that Boyd et al. collected. Um, and we also made sure to collect the data in a way to have those two data sets talk to each other. So that kind of brings my total sample size to 25 sites. And that's almost the entire population of known red linear, anthrop or red linear sites to date that have diagnostic anthropomorphs. However, <laughs> the Alexandria project data was still in its raw form, so I absolutely had to comb through terabytes of gigapant imagery and 3D models to identify, illustrate, and collect attribute data on them all. Each identified figure received a unique identifier that tied its trinomial to the attributes that I recorded, and then I put that all into a master Excel sheet. And while the attribute analysis really took up a large part of my thesis, I couldn't imagine how fruitful um, it actually proved to be at the end. And hopefully I will show that fruitful a little bit later. By the end, my sample consisted of 338 newly identified anthropomorphic figures which effectively doubled the known red linear style anthropomorphs ever documented. Combining these with the 2013 Boyd et al. sample, I got the total up to 614 red linear anthropomorphs I used in this analysis. My, my sample size also includes 25 sites, sorry, 25 sites, and they spanned the whole lower Pecos region. As you can see on the map right there, we have examples from the Rio Grande, we have examples from the Pecos River, and we have examples from the Devil's River. Unfortunately, the empty spot in the middle is Lake Amistad, and most of those are inundated. So one of the first things I did after cleaning up all of that data was compare the Boyd et al. data set or the Boyd et al. sample with my newly expanded sample. And I don't expect you all to read this overly complex table, but um, I just wanted to show it to you because it's absolutely amazing what kind of popped up. So... Um, what I want you to get from this is that the green highlighted areas show similar percentages across all attributes between the two samples, with the only exception being figures without biological sex markers. Here, they're labeled gender, but I want you to say they're biological sex markers. I did not try to identify any gender or anything like that in this presentation, in this presentation or research. Um, and I prob the only difference 
that that may may just be the way that we collected data. Boyd et al. did most of their data collection directly into the field, where I relied heavy heavily on gigapan imagery. And when you're looking at something that's sub-centimeter and you're looking at an image that's over multiple meters across, you are likely to lose a couple here and there. So I expected the Boyd at all frequencies to be a little different given that their data was collected um, from both different sites in different anthropomorphs and the variation was surely to show up but I didn't expect almost every single attribute to occur in similar frequencies from two comparable sample sizes. I just find that absolutely nuts. Um, and it's, I'm just lucky that the individual sample sizes were equal and close enough, but um, beyond that, it gets better. So I didn't just want to compare those frequencies. What I wanted to do is see how much one sample could actually account for the variation in the other sample. So how I did this was I performed a linear regression between the two and calculated the coefficient of determination. And at 0.87, I'd say that is an absolute huge win, which means that 87% of the variation in my expanded sample is predictable by the numbers from the Boyd et al. sample, meaning that although the numbers come from different sites across, land, across the landscape, their frequencies are fairly predictable, which is exactly what you want to see in a style, uh, meaning that the attributes for the red linear style are predictable, and that's a good thing because it that means it's a good style. All right, so let's delve into the most common traits of a red linear anthropomorph. On average, these figures stand about eight centimeters tall with a standard deviation that mirrors that measure. Uh, their width is typically around three centimeters with a similar degree of variation. And while red dominates the color palette, distinguishing between, or I had a hard time distinguishing between the dark reds and the blacks, um, that posed occasional challenges, and I would not take that number for granted or um, because also we have yellow and white as well. But the dark reds and the blacks were very hard to distinguish in the photographs. Uh, your standard portrayal still features figures standing, uh, mostly facing right in profile. They have a pointed head. And quite often they have a phallic symbol being present, um, indicating a male biological sex. All right, so after countless hours of cleaning the data and putting them into various pivot tables, uh, I began running a lot of the chi-square tests by comparing certain attribute types to others to see if they were there was any significant patterns in it. Um, those determined significant at 95% confidence, I calculated adjust your adjusted residuals. And so basically to give you an idea of adjusted residuals, um, any, any number over 1.96 or under negative 1.96 means that that number of cases with those attributes are significant, statistically significant, larger or smaller than the expected values under the null hypothesis. So when the, when the residuals were calculated, the patterns began to show up. And particularly in, spec to, in respect to biological sex markers, females were significantly more likely to be curvilinear body shaped. They were significantly more likely to be in the kneeling and squatting positions. They were often portrayed with distended bellies and as well as having skirts. They were also less likely to be standing or have stick bodies. Attributes tied to red linear males also began to pop up. They were more likely to be wide bodied and standing, but less likely to be curvilinear or have distended belly or skirts. Uh, one of the reasons this ended up being pretty important is because there are known cases of males with distended bellies. Um, and however, in the past, researchers have interpreted bellies as portraying pregnancy. Males still have distended bellies, 
but significantly less likely than females to have it. There is also a large portion of anthropomorphs of unknown sex, meaning that there is no biological sex markers associated with it. Um, however, they're still more likely to have certain attributes, such as being stick bodied. Um, they, they're also often portrayed with distended bellies as well, and they're less likely to have wide-bodied shapes. This is really interesting because I was I was hoping that these um, anthropomorphs of unknown sex I was able to kind of like categorize as male or female, but in the end, what happened is is they had significant attributes of both sexes meaning that they are likely both male and female and i thought that was absolutely cool so also i examined a couple of non-sexual attributes such as bisected head shapes and they were likely to be associated with wide bodies and less likely to be associated with curvilinear ones Conversely, pointed heads are commonly found on stick figures, but rarely found on wide body shapes. Uh, round heads show a preference to curvilinear forms, um, avoiding the stick-like shapes. So these patterns kind of, they highlight the diverse stylistic expressions within the red linear style, but they still are patterns. And that is, that is absolutely cool. I'm getting excited. All right. Beyond the general attributes to other determining associations, I wanted to explore the measured heights of the anthropomorphs. One of the previous assumptions brought forth by researchers was that red linear is just very small, especially compared to Pecos River style. And yes, on average, that the red linear figure is eight centimeters, like I've said before, but there is absolutely an incredible amount of variation within that. So to look at this variation, the first thing I did was just graphed all of the average heights based upon the site that they were located in. And one of the immediate things that came to my attention was that a lot of the average heights on the site were associated geographically, specifically associated with the Pecos River or the Pecos River or the nearby Rio Grande those were much more taller than the ones that I was seeing associated with the Devil's River. So to further explore this, I organized all of the site data, uh, the average heights on the site data based on its easting or geographic location from the west to the east. And as soon as I did, well, I, I feel like the graph basically speaks for itself. Uh, what this graph indicates is that there's a clear difference between heights of red linear anthropomorphs in the east than there are in the west. The difference is just not that east versus west either. It's a gradual pattern going from the highest in the far west to the lowest in the far east. And so kind of like with this insight in mind, I just started to look, I started looking at the attributes, all of the other attributes on the landscape too. And this obviously required me to completely alter my data and get it working right in the spreadsheet. If anybody knows putting an Excel spreadsheet into a GIS format sometimes can be completely tedious, but it was very much worth it. So performing my geospatial trend analysis on average ant height by site, it was determined that the height differences gradually decrease the further east you go. Uh, simply stated, there are different, different red linear style patterns in the east than there are in the west. And that kind of blew my mind. We always thought it, but now we were able to statistically determine it. Um, and by doing this, just looking at the height data, uh, obviously required further analysis to see if there's any other patterns that emerged on the landscape. Guess what? There were. So when I layered the attributes onto the landscape, more patterns emerged. Hotspot analysis bolstered by the heat map that I'm showing you right now uh, indicated a Western concentration of the bisected head shapes 
And from there, I ran a bunch of chi-square tests and that confirmed, again, the regional differences in head shapes, revealing a clear east-west dichotomy in those stylistic elements. The pointed head shapes. They did not show a significant regional variation in both the chi-square or hotspot analysis, indicating a more complex distribution pattern. But this is also exactly what I really wanted to see because pointed head shapes were also often thought of as a diagnostic attribute, and you do not necessarily want to see regional variation if you're using a diagnostic attribute for a style. Penis emblems, however, or penis adornments did display a clear regional split with a higher concentration in the West. Patterned, uh, the pattern was also supported by significant chi-square results with significant adjusted residuals. Then I kind of turn to the centristyled bodies. Uh, centristyled bodies basically means that they're wide bodies where they're either hollow inside, they have either zigzag patterns inside, um, but they're uh, centristyled. Um, they correlate or centristyled correlate predominantly in the West um, and intriguingly wide body Wide bodies and centristyled are often thought of as, or they're usually under one big definition as the same thing. But what I did was I ended up trying to isolate the difference between a centristyled and a wide body. And what I found out was the significance really only remained with the centristyled and not the wide body alone, which is really good because centristyling could be a regional marker, whereas when you look at the wide bodies, when you take away the center styling, they do not show any significance in the east-west significant. They that that significance vanished, and that dis, that suggests that the wide bodies are a distinctive attribute um, that is more kind of a diagnostic as opposed to the central style, which is more regional varied. Curvilinear body types also showed no significance in the East-West, underscoring another unique, um, diagnostic. So curvilinear body types are a good diagnostic for red linear style as well. And stick bodies as well did not show that. So when the past is, and a lot of the literature has discussed these before, those diagnostics do fairly hold true. However, bisected head shapes and penis emblems and stuff like that do show significant regional variation. There may be diagnostic of regional variation, but not of red linear style as a whole. All right, so the spatial analysis results uh, show patterns identified. They align with the red linear style, but then also we identified clear regional variations. And taking all of this into account really informed the next phase of my thesis, which was the radiocarbon dating. And um, hopefully enlightens a little bit more of the temporal framework for the style, which is my next question. So with the assistance of Dr. Karen Steelen, Steelman and a ragtag group of volunteers, each of the samples that we collected on site were processed using her new 10 chamber plasma oxidation system created by Dr. Steelman at the Schumla headquarters in Comstock. I think she named it Nateo, and I think that's a perfect name for this system. For the radiocarbon dating, I chose four sites containing red linear style figures that displayed those diagnostic anthropomorphic attributes like we were talking about before. And they were also identified diagnostic both in Boyd et al. papers and by previous researchers as being diagnostic attributes. So the sites that I chose were Serenity Overlook, Cueva Quebrada, Continental Red Linear, and Hibiscus Shelter. So with the help of Dr. Steelman and the volunteers, 
We collected both paint samples and unpainted background samples nearby to double check to make sure of the contamination. Uh, no contamination, not make sure of contamination. Unfortunately, though, one of our samples from Hibiscus Shelter did have high contaminate levels, and we did not send that off to AMS Dating. We chose two figures or sampled two figures from Hibiscus Shelter based on their similarity to figures in the Guadalupe Mountains, which would have been awesome if we got it. Um, and then also we wanted to, this site has also got went through archaeological uh, terrestrial excavations and I wanted to be able to connect that. So it was a huge bummer that these did not contain significant carbon for dating. But at the same time, we still got some good results later. So in addition to four, those four sites, the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory provided Shumla with a sample from the actual red linear type site itself for radiocarbon dating. And this was just kind of serendipitous. Um, so during solving Turpin's dissertation research, she noted that she collected a spall containing a known portion of the rock art panel from the type site that, that was removed naturally after a freeze-thaw cycle. Luckily, I was able to obtain calcium oxalates too from above and below the paint layer, and it gave us some really cool stuff. So just to give you an idea, here's an illustration of the main panel at 41VV201 or the red linear type site. And as you can see, the, the white circle down below highlights where we're going to focus our discussion. The sample ends up coming from a spall that fell off in the 80s, like I said, from Solvig Turpin. And you can kind of see just right here how big it was. And it's actually that spall was from two separate um, individuals or two separate anthropomorphs. So the first thing that we needed to do is try to identify where did they come from. And so um, luckily we had with our Gigapan data and legacy data, I was actually able to find the spalls. Here's the spalls that we obtained. I was able to find where they came off of, and we were able to identify that they came from the same figure, which was a big win. Um, but unfortunately, this figure is just lost to age. With that said, we were able to obtain two different radiocarbon samples from this spall. The first one being from 4620 plus or minus 35 radiocarbon, and the second sample from the same figure was 4580 plus or minus 80 radiocarbon. With that said, just to make sure that we were getting and doing good science, we um, made sure that they passed a chi-square test and they passed it. And the weighted average between those two samples was 4610 plus or minus 35 radiocarbon or 5,465 to 5,145 Cal BP. A little bit different than the original 1280 date from the single sample at Cueva Quebrada in 95. But that, it just gets better. Um, we were able to do some really cool stuff with the spall itself. So we dated three samples from the calcium oxalates which provided an opportunity to check the reliability of the dated paint samples. The calcium oxalate accretions growing both above and underneath the paint was scraped and run separately from the radiocarbon dating, but we did radiocarbon date it separately. And lo and behold, all the oxalate dates are in perfect stratigraphic sequence with the rock surface as well as the paint samples, which is just exactly what you want exactly what you want. All right, so for some more fun stuff, um, to start, the first other, the figure sampled from the wall was from Cueva Quebrada, and I chose that due to its proximity and context with the ovoid shape that Ilger dated back in 1995. The red linear anthropomorph exhibits multiple diagnostic attributes as opposed to an ovoid shape, including a bisected head, stick-bodied, splayed legs, 
a phallus, phallus adornment. Surprisingly, though, the attempt to replicate that previous date of 1280 plus or minus 150, ca or 150 BP failed. Um, our diagnostic red linear figure actually dated to 4275 plus or minus 35 years old. So the dated red linear figure adorned with classic iconography, such as hooked headdress, bisected head, penis, uh, it le leads to the greater validity of the red linear style over the previously dated ovals. And I know what you're saying. How could these two things being as associated with each other have such drastic dates? And my answer is Dr. ask Dr. Karen Steelman, and she may give you the same answer. We are uncertain. It may be that there was just significant contamination in the original experimental results. But since most of our dates align with the dates, the other dates that we collected, we feel fairly confident in our dates. The next sample that came was from Continental Red Linear Site. This figure exhibits classic splayed legs, phallus, phallus adornment, elongated wide body type. But also this figure was chosen because A is from the Pecos River and there's very little red linear sites on the Pecos River. And it also represents the largest documented red linear anthropomorph at 71 centimeters in height. Lo and behold, the continental red linear site dates came back at 4590 plus or minus 30 radiocarbon years or 5450 to 5060 Cal BP, aligning with our other findings. Next site at 41VV2038, or the Serenity Overlook, this was on the Devil's River. We dated the two leading anthropomorphs in red linear procession. And if you're unfamiliar with it, the red linear are very, they are often portrayed in procession. Sample one sees has your classic splayed legs, has your phallus with an adornment, a weighted atlatl, rabbit stick, ecstatic hair, and guess what? This figure dates 4830 plus or minus 35 or 5605 to 5475 Cal BP. This one currently represents the oldest example of rock art in the lower Pecos. Sample two from Serenity also possesses very similar attributes to that one other sample, but is located in a different procession. Um, I assume both samples were likely painted at the same time, but I can't be for certain on that. But when run at a chi-square, they do pass a chi-square test um, and their dates end up overlapping. So that's another win. In total... Six radiocarbon dates from anthropomorphs explaining clear diagnostic red linear characteristics were obtained alongside three oxalate dates and a duplicate sample for 41VV201, reinforcing the reliability of the methodology and the findings. With that said, prior to this research, the red linear style was dated to 1280 plus or minus 150 radiocarbon years ago. Now these dates now establish its inception between 4830 and 4275 radiocarbon or 5605 to 4655 Cal BP, positioning it at the onset of the Middle Archaic period. Determining the temporal precedence of red linear style to Pecos River style is absolutely crucial because what was known about the red linear in greater context really needs to be reevaluated now. The findings support Boyd et al.'s 2013 hypothesis that red linear predates the Pecos River style or is contemporaneous with. And if y'all have actually Listen to any of the new Shumla brown bag specials or the brown bag lunchings, you will know that the Pecos River style dates to around the same time as Red Linear now. So the current relative sequence of rock art in the lower Pecos, starting from the top being the 
the most recent and the bottom being the oldest. This is what the current model really looks like. And this is with the dates presented in this thesis and in this research. This is how it now appears or something like this. So although it should be stressed that there really is not currently enough accepted dates for either the Pecos River style or the Red Linear style to really pinpoint any transitionary boundaries, start boundaries, or any endings with extreme precision, I did produce an exploratory Bayesian model that may help understand the possible interactions between the two rock art styles. What I attempted to do is create a model that allowed for no interpretation of overlap or direct sequencing from one to the other. And so what I ended up doing is I chose a continuous modeling for that purpose. Um, I also decided on a trapezoidal boundary for those that you're interested in it for the transitional boundary lines, because this shape is used in instances typically with projectile points to assume that any transition from one style to another is usually very gradual. And that's probably what's happening with this. But again, this is very preliminary because there's not a lot of dates. With these significant caveats in mind, uh, the predicted model suggests that the red linear style likely started around between 6435 and 5345 Cal BP. Uh, the end or the transition to the Pecos River style is modeled to occur around 5120 to 3960 Cal BP. So notably the Pecos River style's inception is modeled at 5620 to 4165, which suggests a more transitional boundary than the current dates imply. The termination of the Pecos River style is modeled to occur around 2815 to 620 Cal BP, but that can change, you know, with more dates, of course. But returning to the dates that we have, um, during the emergence of the red linear style, the dates currently presented place it in the Eagle Nest Canyon phase, which occurred around 5,500 to 41 radiocarbon years before present. And a significant amount happens during that time. Um, Emily McQuistian, which if you haven't read her thesis, I highly recommend it. Um, she conducted a summed probability model distribution using all the earth oven dates from both inside rock shelter to, or within rock shelter deposits uh, currently present in the lower Pecos record. And her model indicated a huge population increase around that time period too. And consequently, uh, this subphase exhibits some of the earliest cultural traits thought to actually define the lower Pecos cultural area. Uh, evidence of Datura, sandals, peyote, um, what we call ritualistic toolkits, figure eight sandals, and a big intensification of earth ovens all occur around this time period. So a whole lot is going on and it's just right for the picking. All right, so let's circle back to the beginning. The purpose of my thesis or my research was to further define the characteristics of red linear style anthropomorphic figures and establish a temporal relationship with other regional rock art styles. So there's going to be a lot of text, but let's go through that checklist. Have I further defined the characteristics of red linear style anthropomorphic figures? I believe I did. I've determined that certain attributes are statistically significant and associated with other red linear attributes. I have identified significant patterns across the landscape, including elements like height, center styling, head shape, body type, penis emblems, and among many others. I've also discerned specific attributes significantly correlating with biological sex markers, such as females often depicted with distended bellies or curvilinear bodies. They're often in squatting or seated positions with skirts. And in contrast with that, Males are associated with standing poses, pointed head shapes, and broad body types or wide body types. 
Also, the unknown sex category encompasses attributes from both sexes, and I think that's absolutely awesome. And it could not be conclusively categorized using a binary approach. And I think I would like for y'all to kind of think about that. We cannot always use that binary approach when we when we address rock art. So at this juncture, I propose that the unknown sex category represents, in fact, its own distinct group. And I think I went back. Let's Okay, so next, did I establish a temporal relationship with the other regional rock art styles? I think I did that too. I successfully obtained six radiocarbon assays on five anthropomorphic figures displaying clearly diagnostic red linear cell attributes. I was able to further support those findings using replicate results from the red linear type site. Uh, which showed two assays that were statistically indistinguishable with, from one another with the assistance of Dr. Steelman. And I also obtained three radiocarbon dates on oxalate growths from both above and below that same replicate sample. And they all adhere to the proper stratigraphic relationship from oldest to youngest. So what are the next steps? Well, Obtaining a wealth of good data opens up so many more questions and could absolutely take decades to attempt to answer. Um, first, I would like to see more analysis on the anthropomorphic data. Uh, this thesis or this research barely scratched the surface of potential analysis. I would definitely advocate something like uh, principal component analysis or cluster analysis using all of the attributes of the collected data. Um, I definitely would like to see additional spatial analyses, perhaps involving least cost pathways between sites would be cool. Um, uh, I would also like to see a temporal distribution across the landscape when we get more, uh, get more data sets or get more dates. Um, that would be very insightful. And another step would be to undertake a similar analysis with the Alexandria date or data including the zoological aspects, which we're currently missing from our understanding of the red linear style. I mean, that is literally half of the red linear style that has, is just ripe for the taking. Uh, moreover, I definitely think that we should examine all the figures thematically. I mean, while theme does not necessarily define style, it is still a significant aspect. And given the observed differences and notes on possible different functions, um, between red linear style and Pecos River styles, the thematic analysis might provide those valuable insights. But uh, however, before we tackle these questions, we require more radiocarbon dates to fill in those current gaps. I know Shumla is doing a heck of a lot of work on the Pecos River style and a lot of new dates are coming out and just stay tuned for those because they should blow your socks off. But um. Other than that, it's also just essential for refining our Bayesian models and focusing on the initiation and trans transitional boundaries between the styles. Um, lastly, we must integrate our knowledge of the red linear style with the rest of the terrestrial archaeology. I mean, if you take anything away from this talk, is they both are from the same people. The dirt archaeology and the rock art archaeology is from the same people, and we must start treating them as that to get a better picture of what's going on. So, summing up, the study explored the similarities and differences of the red linear anthropomorphs using data from 614 figures across 25 sites. The red linear style is determined to be governed by rules that show up in patterns, both in the attributes themselves and on the landscape. This study also, through radiocarbon dating, placed the red linear style um, 3,000 radiocarbon years back from then what it was previously known. And at this current point in time, um, the red linear style has identifiable diagnostic attributes and is governed by rules stylistically and spatially 
and the red linear style is not younger than the Pecos River style as previously thought. Now, whether these results are confirmed or refuted with future, future data, my goal remains the same. And that is, I hope this thesis sparks future research in the area that we learn, we can learn so much about the prehistoric inhabitants of the Lower Pecos and their life ways. And with that, I would like to thank Dr. Boyd, Dr. Bowsman, and Dr. Steelman for putting up with me uh, for all of their insight and extensive knowledge and extensive knowledge in their respective fields. Um, this paper definitely needed some TLC, and I thank them so much for working it out with me. I'd also like to thank Schumel Archaeological Research and Education Center for providing such an amazing data, data set to work off of. Um, and then the collaboration with Dr. Steelman and Shumla to be able to obtain these radiocarbon dates. I'd also like to thank everybody that worked on the Alexandria Project team for putting in the blood, sweat, and tears to obtain this data because there was some long hours put in to get that data. Um, also, I'd like to thank TARL or the Texas Archaeological uh, Research Laboratory, TPWD, um, and working with us to provide the VV201 sample from the type site. And also, I would like to acknowledge Dr. James Garber, the Council for Texas Archaeologists, and the Sacred Sites Program or Sacred Sites Research for all of their financial support um, to obtain all of these radiocarbon dates. If it wasn't for your generosity and belief in the value of that research, it, this would never have happened. And then, of course, finally, my heartfelt thanks goes out to all the landowners and volunteers that made the collection possible. If it wasn't for the landowners, a lot of these sites would probably already been destroyed. And the volunteers of this project, without those, it wouldn't have been possible, too. So thank you for letting me talk your ear off, and I would love to hear what you have to think about it. All right. Let me stop sharing screen. And here we are. All right. Thank you very much, Jared. Uh, it's always great to see a, uh, dates associated with uh, rock art. We don't get that too often. So that, that was particularly exciting. Um, so this is our uh, time for Q&A. Um, please use the chat if you have a question and haven't put it in already. Um, we do have some already in there, so I'm going to start with those. Um, so f I, I, there were some technical questions. Uh, so let's just take care of those first. Uh, so first was uh, the meaning of Cal BP. Uh, Cal BP, calibrated BP. So um, when you take a radiocarbon dated sample, you get a date back, but that also doesn't really adjust for the atmospheric carbon in the area because that fluctuates over time. So what you have to do is you have to run it in, through a model. Um, you can run it through models online. A lot of people use OxCal. And basically what that does is it calibrates it to that time period on how much um, atmospheric carbon is in, or how much carbon is in the air to give you a better date. So when you're reading articles, you're probably going to get radiocarbon years before present, and that's basically what you get from the laboratory, and then you're going to get calibrated years before present, or and that's going to be a different date, but it's going to reflect more of what's happening in the real world. Okay, and is that based on dendrochronology? How, what do you, how do you do the It's based on a lot of it, but yes, dendrochronology is one of the primary ways. So um, when they do calibrate it, even for regional variation, places that have good dendrochronology, you're probably going to get better calibrated dates. Um, there's a lot of ways to go about it, and there's I highly suggest you just go to the OxCal, O-X-C-A-L website, to get more, there's plenty and plenty of articles on that. Okay, great. Um, second uh, te technical question. Uh, you mentioned the chi-square test. Could you kind of explain what that is and why, you know, what's the purpose of using it? Basically, uh, the chi-square test shows whether it's significant, the variation with your sample group is significantly different. Um, 
um, chi square is just it tells you if there is significance. So your null hypothesis, let's say you're looking at two two samples. I'm looking at the frequency of bisected heads and the frequency compared to um, a different like standing figures. Now your null hypothesis would tell you that there is no statistic, no significant difference between those two. But if you get a different various a variation in the chi square, it will say that there is a significant difference, and that's something that you need to pay attention to. But um, you need to run different uh, statistical samples to determine where that significance lies. But basically, it tells you that if you had a normal distribution of um, a population, you should not see very, you should see a specific type of variation with that population. But if you get significant results, it's saying that it is more varied than what you should see, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, and the other uh, technical question was, uh, could you describe uh, how you're using the Bayesian analysis? Um, the Bayesian analysis at this point was incredibly preliminary. And what I really wanted to see was, based on the, the dates that we have, um, how does the red linear and Pecos River style overlap? Or does it overlap? Um, because a lot of the previous work was saying that we had one culture that did one style and another culture that did another style. And when one culture dwindled away, the next culture came. And what I wanted to look at is, is that in fact true? Is Are these styles representative of different cultures or different functions? And of course, with Bayesian analysis, that's not going to truly say it, but it may hint at an overlap that's saying that, in fact, these may be a, the same culture and these styles are just different functions. Um, a big thing that happens in rock art styles is we tend to associate a style with only the chronology and not with the culture itself. And cultures can have more than one style. And so I was trying to kind of hit at that. But at the same time, it's just so pre preliminary. I really don't want to go into it anymore because we need more data for me to be certain about that. Yeah, well, given that you've got some archaeology going there and now that you've got some dates, um, is the archaeological evidence indicating that there was some change in culture in that time period or wasn't? Um, it, the archaeological date, especially with Emily McQuistian's uh, some probability distribution, she had a heck of a lot more dates to work with than just a handful. And we do see, we know that there is environmental data that suggests that we're at that time period. Um, it is becoming extreme in, in Zarek. And there's even a small portion of that time period um, that saw catastrophic flooding um and anything like that or so we do see the potential correlation between environment and terrestrial archaeological stuff we see an increase in earth ovens and we see an increase in a lot of other stuff so it may suggest social cohesion but what i would suggest for you is to read emily mcquistian's thesis uh, Charles Koenig's new dissertation discusses earth ovens a lot too and um, kind of go in there. Turpin also talks about cyclical nu nucleation um, and there is I still although the dates with the red linear for Turpin may need to be shifted the ideas about cyclical nucleation should still be addressed and thought of for sure. Yeah, so okay, uh, some questions about the dating itself. So you, you talked about the calcium oxalate, um, which is above and below, but you also talked about directly dating the paint. Um, do you know what the composition of the paint is and, and what was the organic matter that you were able to date in the paint? 
That is one of the the big questions. Um, we are not 100% sure of what the organics in the paint are, but because we're doing chemical pretreatment and we're using plasma oxidation, um, we're, we know we're dating organics in the paint. Uh, but at this point in time, I am not 100% sure anybody knows exactly what those organics are. But um, there has been experimental results and many papers on the experimental results that could um, that point to animal fats uh, being put into the paint. These these paints were mineral pigment based, but there has to be some sort of organic binder in it to have those organic or those mineral pigments placed onto it. Yeah. So do you suspect that the paint formula was consistent across all the red linear or? or not, or don't know enough? I, I would, I definitely wouldn't say that. I would just say that they're based on the dates that we got, we know there's organic pigment, uh, there's organic binders within the pigment of it. Now, whether they come from the same plants or anything like that, that I cannot, um, that I cannot say. But yeah. that's also why it was so important that we also dated the calcium oxalates which is a completely different way that uh, carbon goes comes on. And we were able to date the above and below of those. And we got perfect stratigraphic sequencing on those dates using two separate methodologies. So that, that in, con that in conjunction with dating five different sites across the entire lower Pecos and five in multiple figures and they all date to around the same time period. We are incredibly confident in those. Yeah, so you, you mentioned that originally the Pecos Rivers style was thought to be, um, what was it, earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the reason for that? Was it superimposition? And then now that the dates are switched, you know, how do you explain why it didn't match up with whatever the uh, criteria was for the yeah, early. so um, the Pecos River style was actually one of the very first um, paint styles to be radiocarbon dated by Marvin Rowe uh, way back when. And um, there was a, an incredible amount of um, Pecos River style sites dated, and most of them were around anywhere between, I think it was like 1425 BP all the way to like 4200 uh, Dr. Karen Steelman did a, a paper recently and reanalyzed and relooked and revised all of the dates that we had because there was quite a bit of them and found, you know, certain instances where we don't have good provenience on them. So we shouldn't probably be using those dates. And, the, and so those dates started to narrow down. But Pecos River style was always thought to be older than Red Linear style. And those dates, since we had so many of them, really kind of confirmed that. Um, but when Dr. Carolyn Boyd, Charles Koenig, and Amanda Castaneda started looking um, after doing some documentation, what they were finding was that red linear was found underneath the Pecos River style, which is not necessarily possible if it's supposed to be more recent in time. So... That was the main reason why I kind of took this project on is because there was that conflicting dates. So the radiocarbon dates for Pecos River style put it in the middle archaic. Um, the red linear was thought to be coming in with the bison herds much later in time or, or much more recent in time. But then at the same time, the red linear was underneath Pecos River style. So that didn't match up. And so I just went ahead and decided, okay, then we need to radiocarbon date the red linear itself and get that way and see if it confirms the superpositioning that Dr. Boyd and Charles and um, Amanda saw, or did it confirm what Dr. Salvik Turpin was seeing? Um, and it ended up confirming and supporting what Dr. Boyd saw that red linear was older than or contemporaneous with. Yeah, okay, so now you're consistent with what you're seeing with the superimposition. Absolutely. Okay. Um, did you do much 
uh, looking at the landscape itself to see whether, like, for example, you'd have larger fig where you had larger figures were the uh were the panels bigger to begin with there was any correlation with you know with some of the stylistic features with differences in the landscape or the or the caves themselves yeah um not methodologically but just kind of going through and looking i didn't necessarily see a big correlation um, like the biggest figures at Continental Red Linear, um, that the the monster ones that that was at you know seventy plus centimeters tall, that was in a fairly small cave, and um, and in a small cave in different places, you found the your typical figures. In fact, in a very similar scenario, some of the figures were about two centimeters tall. Um, there has been talk in previous literature about red linear being associated with overhangs. Um, and that was primarily because of two of the major sites, uh, 41 or the red linear type site is a, more of an overhang shelter and, um, another one 41 VV 1000, which is on the devil's river is very similar to that one is at an overhang. But at the same time, they're almost everywhere. I have not been able to pinpoint any um, any true difference on where they're be where they're being put on the landscape as opposed to any of the other rock art styles in the region. Okay, uh, so someone asked about a site that I'm not familiar with, but asking is there a relationship is there a relation to the Guadalupe? Uh, red linear style figures i wanted to figure this out so bad this was one of my big questions that i could not answer um so we i wanted to date one of the figures and i put it in um i put it in the slides and it from hibiscus shelter that had similar attributes to the figures on the guadalupe red linear um, unfortunately that did not had, um, significant contamination and not, or not enough carbon to be able to date it, which really upset me. Um, but one thing that I would like to see is more of a, uh, more of a narrow definition of what Guadalupe red linear is and its attributes. I think that would go a long way. I know that Guadalupe Red Linear has been dated and has gotten similar dates in the past, but the figures that were actually dated from Guadalupe do not share the same diagnostic attributes as Red Linear. Now, those sites that were dated, there are figures that have diagnostic attributes that I would say are absolutely, I mean, very similar to um, the Lower Pecos Red Linear but unfortunately, those were not the ones that were dated. So what I would like to see is a comparative analysis of ones that have matching um, attributes before we move on to that. Okay. Um, someone was curious to hear more discussion over the, um, the biological sex and gender that you pointed out. Uh, particularly, you were saying that some had characteristics of both. Yeah, so the, the ones, I mean because I didn't want to look at gender because obviously gender is a very fluid and different than biological sex. What I could just argue is, does it have a phallus or does it have a vulva? And even then those are still defining a specific attribute or characteristic that may not even represent what we think it does. But with that said, the skirts do tend to be more, or the skirts and curvilinear figures do tend to be associated or attributed to red linear figures that depict vulvas or circular um, portrayals in their abdomens. Um, also distended bellies, but the, the ones that do not have any primary sex characteristic, the, that they do not have a phalli, they do not have a vulva, they do not have sex, secondary sex characteristics, those in themselves have characteristics of both sexes and since that you know the males were more likely to be stick figures and splayed legs we have a lot of 
figures that do not have foul eye that are stick figured and splayed legs. But then we also have curvilinear figures that don't have vulvas, but they also don't have any portrayal, but they also have foul eye. So it's or the unknown sex characteristic. You can't look at a red linear figure that doesn't have biological sex characteristics and be able to determine whether or not it is male or female. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to um, explain. That in the past, somebody is like, okay, we have a bunch of these stick figures. They're most likely male. We can't necessarily say that unless they have a phallus or um, a sex characteristic associated with them. Yeah, so the curvilinear ones typically, if I'm remembering correctly, had the like it looked like curved legs. Mm -hmm. Yes, in most cases. Um, so you, maybe you interpret that as kneeling down. Is that the way you would think about it? Uh, for the most part, yes, correct. Yeah, and, and did they have implements the the kneeling? If they are kneeling, did they have implements that would indicate of what they're doing? Um, if they are kneeling, they usually have stick bars as their paraphernalia. Um, and stick bars are still associated with both male and female, but they're mostly associated with curvilinear figures. But with atlatls, atlatls are either associated with males or unknown sex. There's no atlatls that have female biological sex characteristics. And, and but, did you have any atlatls on the curvilinear? Um, I do not remember. I, I'm not gonna, I will not lie to you. Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of interesting to see what implements go with what yeah. poses. I, I do not think so. Hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Cause then you could sort of lean towards maybe some interpretations of the different poses, what they represent. Right. Um, Let's see, there's, um, I think, one more, um, I guess it's a suggestion, which is if you have any familiarity uh, with programming in Python, um, the suggestion is you might try the GeoPandas library, which is designed to work with uh, GIX and Excel files, convert between them, etc. I don't know if you've done any playing around with Python tools. I've played around with a little bit of it, but I I need a heck of a lot more experience. I've I've usually just created messes when I've tried. Yeah, I mean it's nice. A lot of the a lot of that code now is in packages, so it, you don't have to be a real programmer to to take advantage yeah. of them. And, yeah. um, so um, maybe you could take a look at those and see if they could be helpful. Um, so I think we've covered all the questions. Um, there's a bravo for you, and I'm sure that a lot of people share that feeling. This is a pretty interesting talk, um, both to see sort of the, the um, all the statistics and stuff that you used, as well as to see what the uh, final results were. Um, so again, thank you for your presentation. Thanks to all the attendees for your interest as well. Remind you that if you'd like to learn more about Aurora or get involved, please check out our website, Facebook pages. We always invite everybody to renew or join our membership to support the study and conservation of rock art. And we hope to see some of you at our annual conference coming up in Farmington this May. So until next time, uh, good night, everybody, and stay safe. <laughs>